our multidisciplinary research center has some college of arts and sciences. We have a master's program in digital humanities, and we have um, a bunch of programming for this fall. Um, we have a lot of lunchtime talks about works in progress or recently published projects. We have other workshops coming up. Um, we have some conferences that we're co-sponsoring. So we have our spring 2020 events at a glance, and I think that we've even added a couple more since this has been printed. Um, and you can also, you probably heard of us through our mailing list, but if not, definitely um, give us your email address or find us on our website to sign up and you'll hear all about our events. So please pass that around. We also have stickers and swag. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm really excited. This is our first workshop of the 2020 semester. Um, so I want to introduce Zach Stella. Zach is a second year master's student in our digital humanities program. Um, he is a fellow here within the center. And for the past six months or more, he's also been working on the loyalism project um, with Kyle Roberts of the American Philosophical Society. Um, and I think that is where you started your work on Scalar and then really taken to it. And there's been just increasingly more and more faculty and students who are wanting to know how to kind of create these really rich, complex like digital storytelling, their digital archives or exhibits through Scalar. So we're really excited that Zach is able to come and share his knowledge with us. Um, so I'll let you take it away. Please feel free to help yourself to food throughout. We're also recording on Facebook Live, uh, which only shows Zach on the screen. But if you were to speak, like your break would also be. All right. Um, I think it might be interesting to just kind of go around and kind of get a gauge of everybody's sort of uh, research interests, their background, and maybe some familiarity with uh, content management systems uh, they've used in the past. Um, I've used Scalar, like Liz said, uh, maybe for the last six, seven months, um, building out this project with uh, Dr. Roberts, who a couple of you are familiar with. and. Uh, I know how to use uh, Emeka pretty extensively as well. Uh, that was part of a research project I did last year. Um, but I think I've gone to the scalar side in terms of like what it can do and uh, the sort of stuff I'm interested in. Um, so yeah, if we want to go around, just kind of briefly say. Uh, yeah, I've never built in scalar myself. I've only um, worked with students and faculty who are building this up. So I'm interested to see if I could um, potentially use it for a project that I'm working on. I've taken, I took a workshop on Scalar at the Digital Humanities um, Summer Institute last year. And um, it was a pedagogical workshop. And I, I thought that it would be really good for our first year writing classes as a way of um, having students do research collaboratively. I think Scalar would be a really good vehicle for that. So. And what is, what, are, what is your name? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Melissa Bradshaw. Hi, everybody. My name is Grishma Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before I continue, that link did not work for me, so I imagine I'm typing something wrong. Mm. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to replace Zach's writing. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> yes, he did mention, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <actually>. um, <laughs> My name is Krishna Shah, like I mentioned, and uh, I'm a, a doctoral student at National Lewis University. I'm doing my PhD in psychology, and I'm actually a professional artist. So I believe that um, statistics are great, but um, they're not very human. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to bring the human into the statistics, and I'm doing that through digital storytelling and, and what seems to be digital humanities. Um, so I'm kind of nudging my school to accept more of what digital humanities has to offer. Excellent. I'm Catherine, um, the intern for the director of the center and also a faculty member in anthropology. Um, so I have not used Scalar. I have used Omeka um, sort of in the classroom for my students. Um, but mostly uh, I work on like databases. So that kind of um, stuff. So I'm excited to learn more. I'm Emma Horst. I'm an English PhD student, first year, um, and I know nothing about Scalar or really digital humanities. So, and I'm just interested in using it as a teaching tool. And Zach's in my comp, my um, teaching college comp class. So, that's that idea. 
please support and figure out what this is all about. <laughs> Hi, I'm Prakriti. I'm a first year of digital humanities student here. Uh, we, I, our last, uh, the project for the last semester, a group of students, but I didn't because I've just been introduced to digital humanities at large. So I'm kind of curious to see, uh, get a personal introduction to it and also see what we could have probably changed um, in our own project and like compare a little bit about what we could have done, could not have done, stuff like that. I'm Anna. I'm also a first year in digital humanities masters. Uh, similar to Kriti, I used Taylor for a project last semester. It looks kind of okay, but I really need to learn how to <laughs> use it better. I've also worked with Omeka and a couple of their uh, archiving type platforms. Hi, my name is Emily Ryer. I'm the new director over at the Women in Leadership Archives in Piper Hall. Hi, awesome. Um, <laughs> this is my first month on the job, uh, so I've never used Scalar before, um, but I have used other um, archival management systems, so we'll see metadata not so much exhibition based. Um, hi, I'm Bill Sung, and the second year master students at the edge. Um, I have cut, my interest is about the uh, digitalization of cultural heritage objects. So I know I know several uh, digitization tools and also the HTML and the Python. So but I haven't used the Skype. So. Um. Yes, uh, I'm Emily Cookier. I'm a master's student in library science, and I'm currently an intern at the Loyola Library, and I have an interest in. Uh, data librarianship and digital librarianship, and so I'm here. I'm not familiar with Scalar, but I just sort of want to learn all the different tools that people are using to work on digital projects to figure out like what do I need to know at the library to be able to help and support those kinds of research and projects. Hi, I'm Ben Stumpy. I'm a communication and media and theater student at DePaul. Um, and I'm the student assistant at the political science department, and so. I do a lot of work with social media and then also graphic design, so I'm just here to see what I can learn. Okay, excellent. Also, Eliara and Eric and Christy have joined us on Facebook Live. Oh, and they're fine. both um, not so Hi. <laughs> Thank you for introducing yourselves. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to kind of jump into it. Um, I think hit the space bar. There we go. Okay, so. Uh, to sort of the signpost uh, for today's uh, workshop. Um, I'm just going to give kind of a brief background about like what is Scalar, what we can primarily do with it, and uh, the people who sort of use it. And then after, I'm going to show some existing projects with like a sneak peek of the loyalism project, and not too much because we actually have a lunchtime lecture um, slotted for that where we sort of are going to go into that in depth. And then uh, another one of like or two uh, projects that I know about that are built in Scalar. Um, and then I'm going to go into sort of managing or like administrating a, a Scalar project and the sort of back end of like building pages, putting together different kinds of stuff. And then I have a like digital authoring uh, activity that like um, it's good that a lot of people in here kind of have exposure to metadata because I, I think that's kind of like one of the biggest aspects of uh, Scalar. So I'm just going to jump in. So what is Scalar? So it's essentially just a free open source publishing and authoring platform. Uh, and it comes from the Alliance of Networking Visual Contents. Um, on their website, they sort of uh, explain that they're seeking to enrich the intellectual potential of our fields, uh, humanities fields, to inform understandings of the under, uh, expanding array of visual practices as they are reshaped within visual culture, uh, while also creating scholarly context for using digital media, film, uh, uh, for media studies and visual studies, which is quite a lot. Um, it's probably just a lot of, of words to say that like we're building simple sites that sort of, sort of showcase visual and textual aspects aspects of different uh, materials from uh, a bunch of different fields. Uh, I think this is like an interdisciplinary sort of platform that kind of draws upon a lot of different uh, research and uh, backgrounds. So what can we make with it? 
Um, typically, it's used to make kind of digital forms of either books, exhibits, archives. Um, you could also use it to just sort of make uh, educational materials if you want to put it on like library websites or if you want to explain something more in depth. It really doesn't have to be like an archive that has like a thousand images in it. It could just be like used for educational purposes. Um, and so the main functions are to create, edit, and uh, med, uh, manage digitally native content. So that's like written text, uh, media, metadata, the page structures, and the like navigation between them. So if you've ever worked with like WordPress or like Weebly or like any of those, it's it's the essential like same concept. Only this is sort of geared more towards like a humanities uh, background um, and scholarship. And you can also sort of use it um, in sort of some in it in like advanced functionality of Scalar. You can use it to uh, import and export data of like the content that you uh, create. And you can also like get in touch with like what's known as like the API, which is just like nodes that you speak to to draw in other people's data who have like built their own Scalar sites or have built their own. Uh, and it can like import like Omeka data too and like other different kinds of content management system data. A lot of data, but like we won't go too much into that. Okay, so who uses it? Uh, it's great to hear that like a lot of people in the audience um, are kind of coming at this from like the uh, library's perspective. I kind of had that in mind. I primarily was just thinking like it's for humanities scholars from like English history, uh, cultural studies, uh, the, uh, film and media, et cetera. Um, maybe more specifically, it could be used for uh, textual criticism or just like the sh showcasing of historical materials or analyzing historical materials um, for library staff. Like it can be used for like subject specific um, creation of materials, uh, creating exhibits or archives. So like pretty much everything that we like mentioned going around, like it can do a lot of that. Uh, more generally, though, this is sort of, I, th I, I think of like Scalar as sort of, um, and that's why I title it as like digital authoring, because I think that like at the core of it, it's, it's more so authoring and um, the audience or like the people who sort of use it are authors whose work is driven by values that are kind of inherent to D, uh, DH, digital humanities. Uh, including like reflexivity, where we're thinking and rethinking about content we produce. Uh, accessibility is a huge part of digital humanities. So we're thinking about the availability of our content and sort of the ease that we can have when we're gleaning knowledge from it. Um, connectivity, so like creating a network or like a web of connections between us, the people we collaborate with, and the content that we work with. And uh, behind it or underlying it all is identity, sort of like the human personal aspects of, of the content itself. Um, so that's sort of the run through of like what it is or the background. So now I'm going to sort of point to a couple of projects that um, Two of them I uh, worked on, and one is actually from the Newberry, and it's just uh, going to show like a, diff a couple of different ways that you can use this. Yeah, it's already opened. So this is like a sneak peek to like the Maryland uh, Loyalist Project that we'll show in March at our lunchtime lecture a little bit more in, in depth. This is sort of a splash page that you can make within the editor that sort of is just like welcome, and then you hit the begin button and you can have like an introduction page and then at the bottom it links you out to like the contents and how scalar works is like it uses a sort of like nesting 
um, structure where like contents are put within contents and the um, editing tool is sort of set up that way. So the intro page, we can go to like a volume of like one of the documents we wanted to like work with. Specific collection or volume, and then it like the pages that are associated with that volume. So we can start with just like any random thing. And a lot of this is like Laura Mipsum because content is yet to be sort of created. But um, so there's a <laughs> there's a couple of things going on here. I think. The content on the top you can do, there's a lot of different things going on with this project and another project I'll show where like it requires a little bit of mastery of like breaking the HTML code and like laying it out with certain functions, like laying this out in this in this tab thing where we organize like the documents in the categories of narrative, claims, testimonies. Um, when we click on like any of these items, we can see all the details or like where all the metadata lives and a sort of um, look at the facsimile. And I don't know if this, this item in particular has a transcription on it, but there's some uh, transcription uh, or some items with transcriptions in this project that I'm sure we'll run into when we see some other stuff. So from an organizational standpoint, that's pretty much just like how this project is set up. Is, is, um, it's, it introduces you to the project itself, and it says, here's the volumes within it, and here's the associated documents within, the, um, within it. And all of those documents have <coughs> metadata or details explaining the dimensions of, of the um, of the document or the, the facsimile, the scan. So this is, I think, a good example of like a, I think we could call it like a, it, it, it operates as, as an archive and a um, exhibit because it does sort of aim to like preserve these things in digital form, but they uh, it also works to uh, present them and present an argument and that argument would probably come through like the text that is put on top or like in other different pages. Um, a different project um, that I did personally for uh, my textual criticism class with uh, Dr. Marta Warner last year was uh, the creation of a digital edition, which is a little bit different in the sense where like we're, we're looking, it's, uh, how do I describe this project? I just did. So instead of it being sort of uh, an archive where you can sort of just look at a large collection of uh, of documents, um, this is a digital edition of Hamlet, and specifically a, a parallel digital edition where um, I'm putting the first quarto, or what is known as like the bad quarto, is like the corrupted uh, <clears throat> quarto of, of Hamlet, and I put it in parallel with an artist book um, to sort of, sort of show like um, textual similarities and insist upon the meaning together, um, the, the art, the expression, and the uh, old document as it was uh, originally shown. So if we go into it, we can go to like any of these acts and it has like this little thumbnail to show like what's in here. And we have a transcription at the top for the exhibit and then the uh, British Library scan of it and the artist rendition of it um, at the bottom and their associated metadata attached. And so that's an example of, the, of how this could be used as like a digital edition. Uh, of a book. Um, and then the last example would just be, and I, I uh, in researching for the project I just showed, um, I actually do a lot from like this scalar exhibit, but it, I, I see this more as like a informational or like educational tool 
where it, it is exhibiting a lot of different things about Shakespeare, but um, more in like an educational sense. And you can get all this info here. So in all three of these projects, they're, they're, they're set up like in similar ways where like you splash onto like a, some, some welcoming page and then the introduction and then the like dive down into its, its contents. Um, and that's pretty much like how it's set up. Like, uh, so, but to manage it, manage it is like kind of a similar thing because it's not directly intuitive. Um, well, it's intuitive once you get it, but there's there's a little bit of a curve, and I'll kind of go over like what that entails. So, I think in creating um, me and Dr. Roberts. Uh, in sort of creating the loyalism project, we had to sort of have considerations for what we're doing before we sort of go into scalar and break things and organize it. I think it's it's um, important to consider some of these questions before we kind of go into scalar. Uh, so what are the contents you're working with? Uh, what do you want to highlight about the contents? What relationships are you trying to make between your contents? Uh, related to that, how do you organize your content information? I might be, uh, I might be repeating myself, but uh, how, who is uh, going to look at the site, and uh, how might your project facilitate interpretation and discussion regarding its contents? I think these are big, like design. These give us a sense of like the what's possible um, and what's not gives you a good sense of like the constraints in your designing of the project. So with that in mind, I'm going to go to the demo site that we'll be sort of like working out of uh, today. And I'll show you like the messaging of some of these, these things. So here's just like a regular uh, the splash page. It doesn't have like an image attached to it. but. Um, so I'm logged in under my name, and it's going to look different from somebody who doesn't have the login information to this instance. They won't have access to a lot of these tools up here. Um, but this is the splash page. And if I wanted to like do something with the splash page or I wanted to put an image, um, what I would do is hit this little pencil up here. And then the title is Demo of Scalar. Um, you can put a description of it if you, if you want. There's this uh, text box where you can just write any old content. Or you can do, if you have a familiarity with HTML, you can hit like the source button and write your HTML if you want to organize it in a certain way. There's a, it's, it's mostly just like any um, regular text processing. Uh, tool, but then it has like some of these other different functions right here, like in, insert like a link to like a scalar page or a uh, linking scalar content. And um, you can definitely like play around to see like how you want to organize things. So it's it's pretty it's like a WYSIWYG. Like what you type in here is what you're going to get on the on the page that it spits out. Um, the more interesting stuff kind of goes on down here where we look at the layouts, and I set the layout to splash to kind of give it that like dramatic. Ah, here we are. Like, but if I wanted to give it like another sort of style or um, a general like layout, I can say just make this a basic page where the title is here, some images, text. Like it's, it's the co most common sort of template. You can do one with like a header where there's like a big image at the top, but it's essentially the same thing as a basic page. Um, there's not much difference between book splash and uh, book splash and splash. I think one just like includes more author credentials. Um, uh, visual path path I don't use very often, and it I think it breaks a lot. Um, but I'll keep it at splash. Uh, and so from here, you're going to want to like sort of define like the direction that your site goes in. So if you're starting on this like index page, um, you want to first 
Um, you first want to like establish the 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 pages like on their own terms, and then link them together with this relationship uh, tab down here. So uh, if you go to path, it'll say this page is a path, and it contains um, the intro page, which you have to make on its own, and then uh, put it like the, it's going to be contained by the splash page. And you can uh, use like some of this other like path stuff down here, but I don't use it very often. Um, if you want to like add more um, style or like add more functionality to the things that end up on your page, uh, you can put in like custom JavaScript. You can put in custom CSS. Uh, you can put a, th a thumbnail like of the page if you wanted to like show up as a link somewhere else, like so on and so forth. Uh, the properties, you can define your, uh, or you can like make your like URL like slugs like custom and um, make it pretty much like say anything and you can give it, give the page the option if you want to make it visible to the public or hidden if it's like in some, uh, if it's a draft or if it's like not something that's ready to be revealed. Um, content type. This is an interesting uh, thing that we haven't really used quite yet, but like we hope that like for for the loyalism project that like as people are sort of uh, exposed to the project that they like log in on their own accounts and the content that they contribute to our project um, takes the label of like commentary or review or term, and we would grant certain certain access to like people to like leave comments um, if they request it. Uh, leave reviews, and then it becomes like this sort of text that that moves and changes as people are exposed to it. And so I think that's a really potentially very cool uh, part. And then the the metadata, if there is like metadata to be said about this this page, um, probably not. Like you can put, like fields for ju just like pages themselves. But like you usually want to use this function if you're going to be talking about, um, if you're going to be talking about like specific items, which I'll go to. Uh, so we'll save and view that. And I'll take this back here. So that's like sort of what the edit uh, panel looks like. Kind of like going over to more of the administrative stuff. If you want to change anything, first of all, when you when you uh, log in, it's gonna like show you Scalar One's uh, user interface for editing. Um, I always just say try it out at the top. Like it's gonna take you to this old version of the dashboard. Use the Scalar Two one; it's a lot better. Um, I don't know why it. it Gives you the op some people I guess are more familiar with the older way, so they offer both. But here's like the scalar two interface where we're um, editing it uh, with like a I think that there's less like tabs than the original one. Anyway, so like here is sort of the high level stuff where it's like the title of the exhibit, um, a subtitle description. Uh, URL to get to like that index page, um, the um, the splash page. You can put it as a genre uh, if you want to call it a book or an article or a project or whatever. You can um, give it some permissions. Uh, you can set like some uh, different settings for comments, and I like that it's compatible with Hypothesis. Um, the it, which is a tool for like annotations that like again like encourages people to come and like leave their comments like publicly on the different uh, materials um and you can use this t uh, table of contents as well but um sometimes i don't use it as much so um i'll skip over the editorial for a sec um for the styling, if you if you want like a background image for the whole site, you put that here. If you want um, like a thumbnail in your, uh, I don't know even 
what is this even used for? It's like a thumbnail so you can like identify the book that you're using. If you have like multiple books in your in your like scalar um, account. Um, and then custom CSS for like styling of pages at, at, at a global level. So if you want to say like all these pages so, should look this way, you would define the, the rules here. Uh, same thing with, with JavaScript. If you want to have a, a different functionality, you can put that there. Um, here's like the bulk and um, where you're probably going to be spending the most time and everything. Um, it's all your content and it's organized um, between pages. And if you hit that button, you can look at the, the exhibits or the site's media, the different paths between all of the things, uh, tags, which I don't like the tagging version of Scalar or the, the tagging function on Scalar as much, but um, that is there. You can look at different annotations on uh, media items or pages, so on and so forth. So for this demo, I just created like two collections pages that lay out um, some items that I put in there. And I'll show you guys that in a second. Um, so I'm going to go back really quick to I'm going to go back to this content uh, panel, but first I kind of want to go through this uh, example site and just kind of show what, what it looks like on the front and then kind of look back at it in the, in the back end. So there's this demo of Scalar, which I linked to the, um, to the intro page in that um, relationships uh, panel in the, uh, in the edit. And then I also linked this intro page to collection one, collection two, and then a visualization of the whole entire exhibit. And you can click on these freely, or you can use the kind of linear navigation to go through it one by one. And I just put like a couple of facsimiles from the project I'm working in right now. Um, this is sort of the one view that you can sort of display uh, sort of multiple items. And if we go to the pencil, we can kind of look at it like how this is set up. So there's the, you know, filler text, like in this box, there's nothing really great going on there. Um, for the layout, I laid this out as uh, the media gallery, which sort of gives it that um, carousel look and then links all of the different uh, parts of the carousel like below. So it um, gives you more navigation. Um, another interactive thing that I included for the second, uh, the second collection is the structured media gallery, which I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but that's just another way of laying out your, your items to show to people. And uh, Google Map, if, you're, if your uh, project is really like based in like spatial relation or in, um, I guess, like historiography or anything like that, then that, that's a nice tool. And then like they also offer some of these visualizations where if like you're working with a lot of data and you sort of sense a complex um, relationship between all that data, you can use these visualizations to sort of show off like what that looks like in sort of a neat way, um, which is really cool. Um, I don't think I have anything for this. I didn't put any metadata, but just in like uh, giving it this layout, it, it gives it that carousel. I also uh, importantly, I, I want to tell like this collection, like, okay, these items or these like media pieces are within this collection. So I go to relationships and tell it um, what I want it to contain. If I wanted to add more content, um, I think what you'll find like kind of confusingly is there's like a, there's the difference between like pages that holds items and then there's 
items or media. So like no, getting to know that relationship can kind of get confusing, but like um, if you want to lay out a page, you, you first want to like work from like the level of like the page and then have it contain like media items. And so I told this to kind of um, hold these uh, media items. I didn't add anything. And pretty much that's that's how it goes. So what those media items look like. It can also be very slow. And I think I showed you on the on the other uh, on the other project where if you click on these pages, it kind of shows you the metadata. It shows you uh, where it kind of shows up in other different kinds of collections, uh, which is really nice. And down here, if you um, click on any of these, it has its own page like made out. Like when you do put a, a media item in, uh, it has an associated page, which is confusing. But um, that's sort of like the large facsimile of it, the metadata underneath. Uh, citations, I don't really, is, is that page we were looking at. And uh, source material, if you want to like right click and like take the JPEG of this, like go ahead. The, um, and you can also edit these with the same pencil tool. If you want to add metadata to these media items, uh, that's pretty much where this would go. Uh, you can add more, like drawing from these different vocabularies, which um, are you guys familiar with uh, Dublin Core? Or a lot of us are? OK. So Dublin Core, self-explanatory. A lot of these are like for like vocabularies for textual scholarship. Um, and they define like different kinds of things. And like looking at them, you'll get a sense of like what they're kind of used for. And that'll, that'll be part of our activity that we'll do like shortly. Um, so again, you just hit, if you wanna like go to a piece of media and then you just hit the edit button by hitting the, uh, the pencil and uh, then you go over to metadata and, and you would edit all of that here. Okay, so this page currently doesn't have any annotations, but like one of the tools um, that Scalar is used for, or what what Scalar is kind of used for in kind of big ways is uh, transcription work, where we're looking at this this facsimile. Um, if we wanted to like have somebody transcribe this, what they would do is right next to the pencil, just hit the paperclip. And you hit the plus button. Title the uh, the annotation like how big you want to like make the box that like um, highlights certain sections. Or if like you're just doing like an entire thing, like I, I always just make it a, a big box and you write your content down here and like when you go to these pages, uh, you'll see that like ring like in, in the corner. So I'll just say, I think, uh, you can describe it, give it tags and whatnot, save that. And so then when people look at it, uh, look at it in the exhibit, they can highlight over this and then see that their entire <coughs> transcription is, is written out. Um, 
you can give credits. Um, you can uh, pretty much organize that in any way. Um, go back here. Also, feel free to ask questions as I go. Um, I realize that I have I have not really stuck uh, in quite a while, <laughs> but. Um, This is where you can define users for um, who you want to be on your project. I have the role of author, but I can have people come in like who want to like comments or they want to administer it in like some uh, different way. Like you can define that here, and then kind of briefly touching on the uh, the aspects of like data migration that go into this project is like. So for all the contents, like the facsimiles, the pages, and how it's all organized, that's all sort of articulated um, and can be put and packaged into a file that can then kind of be put um, out into what's called like the semantic web for people to find and then take and use it for their own project in a sort of like open source way. And we have a question from Facebook Live, Rhea Moore, uh, who's watching from Bloomington, Illinois. I uh, was wondering if you could expand on why you aren't a fan of the tag feature. What does it do or not do? I always get confused about like what's tagging what and uh, what is tagged by what. Like when you when you use the tags, I don't know. Um, I think it could really depend on your project of like how you're using it. Like it, um, but I don't think that when you tag something, the relationship to what it's tagging or what is tagged by it is like uh, defined very well. Um, I always just kind of like leave it alone um, and try to make more connections in, in different ways um, for the most part. Um, so this is in the utilities uh, box. That's this is pretty much where you're like importing, exporting data of different exhibits. Um, this is more. I feel like this is more geared towards like people who are going to be running like the database. They're like running the data. This not so much like um, writing the content. And there's a, there's. Um, if you wanted to like upload a file, you can like upload uh, like RDF, like JSON, like versions of like scalar sites or Omeka sites or like anything that supports that. Or you can uh, upload CSV with all the different like metadata's um, stuff in there. Uh, but I won't really go into this. I think um, what I'm sort of interested more so is. I want to do this metadata activity because I think like at the meat of it, I think like scalar is more about the thinking about like the contents of your exhibit, thinking about the narrative that surrounds it and the sort of aspects that go around um, deciding what we do show or like what we do talk about in our in our metadata or on like the page contents, uh, so on and so forth. So. So uh, for the activity, uh, if you want to just go to the, uh, the folder. And then that folder, you'll, you'll find this uh, presentation as well if you want to like refer back to it, um, if you want to go off and like do more scalar things. Uh, so you'll just you'll go to the folder uh, that says like, I think it says photos uh, for the activity. Uh, download them to your your computer and um, I'm hoping that we can uh, all find we can just like upload the images to our own instances if you did um, beforehand get your own uh, instance of scalar and then I think it would be really uh, cool to think about um, setting up the metadata or any sort of stuff um, related to like the images and I I chose those images just because they're generic, but they all sort of like serve like 
or have like different ways that we can describe them based on their their context. So um, if anybody like wants to like sit over in my group, we can kind of uh, give like, I, I already have the sandbox up, we can like do that. Um, but we'll, like while we're doing this, I want you to consider like the, these questions to guide your decisions of deciding what metadata do I use to describe this? Uh, what's the narrative behind the the image? What relevant information should people know about the subject of the image? And what can be kind of glossed over or left out? And if you have time, like definitely just like muddle around and, and like play because I think like that's how I pretty much figured out using scalars. Like, oh, now I see how this works. Like, takes a little bit of uh, muddling for sure. So. All right. Is it, so what's the website for Scalar? The website, um, if you uh, if you like signed up for like your own account for Scalar oh, beforehand. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so you're there. Now. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to show you my Catherine's screen. You're going to go to uh, your dashboard, and then I would do the um, try it out. And then from there, you would um, make your own project, make your own book. And then uh, from there, I'll allow you to, uh, to upload uh, images. So that's a question I had. So you are like bringing the images to Scalar. Yes. So, like you have the sort of image set, and you want to like use this platform to display and like contextualize them. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can do it on an individual basis um, with that with that like importing tool. That's where like if you had a collection of like thousands or whatever hundreds of items that's where like you would import it via like a spreadsheet or like a csv um but i think there's only four items or images in that uh that folder and they're all pretty generic like i said um is, is anybody having issues with setting up their book or like getting onto their website so I didn't register beforehand. So does it take a while to know? Yeah, it's um, it's it always takes like a couple of days. <laughs> That's like, two days. Yeah, because yeah, they send you like a code, and then they're like, okay, here's um, Scalar. Okay. So if you want anybody who's having issues with um, getting onto their own instance, um, can like come over here and like we can work on the um, in the sandbox that I set up. So this is as long as I'm. It says you need an email address affiliated with an academic institution, but it, so as long as I'm here, it's free access to yeah. this? Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. What if you use the registration key that was in the email? Yeah. Because I, I, like, literally, I did this in like the last five minutes. And you let in? Well, I'm trying. Okay, yes. Because no. I did it in, in, in. three days ago, and I'm still not in. Hmm. I have oh, it's, that. It's but I use that. You. I use that. I think it's been created and is now present in the list to the right. Oh, here. I can't use a school email. Is it necessary? I use my school email and that registration key that was sent out um, in like the advertising email. The registration key R M three P P D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like I did that like five minutes ago. Okay. And it lets you in like immediately. Am I in? Yes, you are in. From there, here. Yes, it did immediately. Yeah. Oh, I did to me too. You're right. Okay, great. That means, um, uh, would you mind giving uh, Emma the link to that um, code? And uh, I'm sure you can set it up right away and you can have your own without having to wait for the. Okay, but I should request my own, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. The registration. So, key. does 
set up multiple instances, or does it just have like one that's associated with that email address? I think you can set up multiple books, but like the instance. multiple books within, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm already registered for that. Okay. <laughs> you can set up. You can have like multiple emails go into it, at, uh, taking on like different roles, like. Mm -hmm. uh, but it all comes out of like one instance. Gotcha. So, I forgot everything you just taught us. Uh, I think that's kind of a broader question. Sure, yeah. Um, I, yeah, let's definitely. Yeah, so one, so you mentioned um, like multiple books. So is book cluster a scalar for the project? So each, you call like a project a book? Is that kind of? Yeah, I'm kind of going back and forth because it, it offers like, you can call it or like label it as a book, mm -hmm. or you can label it as a project in your like properties. Um, uh, really depends on like how you want to describe it at that high level. Okay, so that's yeah, that's kind of fill in the blank. That's interesting. And then you mentioned um, being able to, to kind of plug in data and data sets from other places, and you mentioned some like interoperability between um, the system and Mecca. So what would that kind of look, look like? Is it just like are you kind of like exporting the data? Like oh, I, I had um, this exhibit on one platform and I want to migrate it to another or they're actually sort of interacting with each other? Yeah, they can they can interact and um, Scalar is like compatible with working oh, with, cool. with Omeka. Okay. How, it, how it would work? Well, I set up like a... Okay, so this is what I did. This. I can just look over this. No, no, it's okay. So I just went to... I just clicked on this. I'm sorry, what was your name? Oh, sorry, I'm Emily. Emily? Here. All right, Emily. Um, so so the way that we would sort of contest Omeka or Scalar or Scalar to another Scalar, it all sort of happens on this level of just gobbledygook like data that like you can produce like in this uh, utilities panel. Oh, browser. So what you would do is like if you wanted to export like a JSON uh, version of this, mm -hmm. you would just hit this button, or you it can be RDF XML as well, and so then it would just give you like essentially the JSON version or the XML version of this exhibit, and it's all laid out and it, and it spits it out for you. And Omeka has the same sort of functionality where like you can export it in these formats mm -hmm. um, and then if you wanted to like connect like some hypothetical um, Omeka site to to this site that you would go up to this like button. what kind of looks like a download okay. button awesome. Thank you. and you yeah. would do work. affiliated archives other archives like Omeka sites or you can draw from SoundCloud Vimeo or YouTube, these all support like the the sort of migration between these these platforms, and that's all sort of written out here. So if we go to Omeka up here, then what you would do is uh, you would first, like in that hypothetical like Omeka site, you would make that RDF version, and it's going to give you like an associated URL where you would link it to, and then put that URL here, and that's pretty much where you're on the level of data, like connecting it. And past that, I think I we haven't really worked in like the data like sphere like as much because we haven't really. Like, reached out to like working with this exhibit or this archive right. quite yet. It's just mo mostly its own project. But um, you know it, but it does support that and it does have the capability to hit different API nodes and do the kind of creative stuff like that. 
beyond my pay grade, but like uh, <laughs> probably useful if you're interested. Yeah, so it looks like you can actually yeah. perhaps um, embed some content as well if you're doing something like link, because I also saw like YouTube listed on there, so it's looking mm -hmm. like it's not locally hosted, you're just kind of embedding it and post it somewhere else. Yep. So interesting. Yeah, definitely. There's a yeah, I think the the creating Shakespeare um, resource from the Newberry they um, they have a bunch of different videos like explaining like different things. That's all from YouTube or video or, or whatnot. So it does support that. Um, are you aware too of um, any sort of projects out there, or have you used the Google Maps function at all? Um, so I saw that was like a capability that was in there too. I, I haven't for, for my projects I haven't, but yeah. if you would like to like mess around with it on in this uh, in this oh, thing, I would be totally for it mm -hmm. to see if we can sort of see what the mapping feature looks like. Yeah, because I'm, that's I'm curious. Where, um, I know there are some institutions that have been trying to collect, you know, like longitude and latitude of buildings and have those very mm -hmm. precise intersections so that you can kind of then can play with mm -hmm. the metadata and sometimes that's a little bit more precise since they have a street address where it might change over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd be interested too to see how that kind of kind of plays with this if there's any any projects out there that are doing more kind of mapping related. I've seen a lot of Omeka projects like doing mapping because they have like I think like I think a more like robust um, mapping feature than uh, Scalar, mm -hmm. but uh, that's mostly because I haven't played with the mapping stuff in Scalar. I'm sure it, it does sort of create that visualization. Um, and I think it de defines it, like if you do put those like longitudinal, latitudinal uh, fields in the metadata, it might be smart enough to recognize where that is and then if you hit like the the mapping feature in the edit then it will it'll are automatically like pin, pin it or whatnot but um uh, was everybody able to like get their those images from the folder onto the site and there are they now sort of uh looking at it playing with it Um, Zach, is there a way to, uh, like, the file of the Willis Tower, like, has metadata, like, contained in the file, uh -huh. right? Um, is there any way to transfer, like, that metadata into, like, a metadata in Scala? Um, right, so, like, if you look here, uh, right, is there any way to take this and put it in, like, is there, is there like, a transfer here? No. I don't think so. I think I think it's mostly manual. Um, when it comes to the uh, like, if you were to do like a mass upload, like all that stuff would have to be put into like a uh, what's it called a spreadsheet like prior to. Also, there may be a way to um, <clears throat> to import it. I'm just not too sure. Okay. Oh wait, auto populate fields from file. Was that a thing? Wait. it says no I PTC or ID three metadata appears to exist in the file. Oh. So I think it wants this particular like a particular kind of like metadata vocabulary. Um, so like not the Dublin core, like the IPTC or something else. What kind of, do you know what kind of vocabulary it's using? Nope. Is it using one? I don't know. <clears throat> It won't let me like click on it anymore because it told me like no. Right? Um, it's just like taking like this and like right if I click here. I guess it would depend on like the kind of file and like the way in which the metadata had been um, 
I think I've used that um, tool in the past, like the auto populate, and it always gives you, it like populates fields that are like, I guess like really obvious about like, oh, what is the link to this page? Oh, what is that? Like it's, it doesn't fill in all the stuff that you would want it to. Essentially, it just creates like more things to point to. Um, I would, I always did it sort of manually if I wasn't working in the spreadsheet. Um, but there's like, um, there's like some like uh, fatigue that can come into just doing it uh, to to doing it uh, one by one. But also, I think that. Um, and the idea that I kind of have behind like doing this activity is like the thinking of like, okay, what kind of fields are available? Which ones should I personally choose to include, depending on like what's the subject of the image, mm -hmm. and go through it that way. You know, if you're mm -hmm. doing it on an individual basis, you you might um, have that sort of thinking. Going through it. I have another question, yeah. but it's kind of related to that. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm like should know. Like importing a CSV file with like many different items. Like, can you attach media? Like, can you put media in that kind of file? Like, yes. upload a photograph. Yes. I'd be very interested in learning about that. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, we definitely did it for um, Kyle's project. I can show you like on an individual basis. Okay. Could you show me as well? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's let's do it right. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for coming, Emma. Um, where do I want to go? Let's start it again. Okay, so uh, a lot of like what we did for this project was uh, laid out in, in this uh, CSV. Um, for this, this is like Excel or like whatever it is. And you can export this as a CSV file and load it up. What you would want to do so that like Scalar um, recognizes that these are titles, this is subject, you would put like how it's written in, in Scalar. You would give it sort of like this DC terms colon title and uh, put that as like the first item and then everything underneath that. And so for the images, what you need to do is define like the, the URL. And the thumbnail is the exact same thing. These are, they're just a duplicate. This will just uh, spit out like a thumbnail version of it and put it on um, the. Uh, um, on the on the site, the links that these point to are your server space where all the like the all of the um, images are held. So if we're on um, CTSDH's um, hosting, like reclaim reclaim hosting, we would have like a folder that like holds all of our facsimile data, and we would point to them with this link in in this uh, spreadsheet. And then um, when we when we upload the CSV, it would uh, 
it would say like, okay, here's where it lives, and then pull all of that data in. How did you go about pointing? Pointing to the to the folder on the host, like on the reclaim host. Uh, so like within the server, mm -hmm. there exists a folder called Kyle Roberts, and in that folder exists a folder called Maryland Loyalism Product, uh, product yeah. Redux, and in that folder exists a folder called Media, and in that folder exists AO12-6 underscore 0001.jpg. I think um, because we like set up our own um, like site or like instance, like it's worth noting. I'm glad this came up because this is this is a big part of it. Is like this um, demo site and like everybody's like demo site is set up on on like Scalar's server, mm -hmm. and it's like a personal site of like that kind of like limits a little bit of access to. Um, Exactly what you can, um, uh, exact. I, I guess like break in terms of like the site structure or any of the different things that go on on the site. You can still import like different um, spreadsheets that like they have links that point to like some some uh, server where that where they're held. I guess I'm. I guess I'm confused about how it goes. Uh, it's okay. Um, I'm just like, like, I'm just trying to think through if I have like a large number of images, <laughs> having to not upload them one at a time. Right. Uploading them one at a time for for this for like Scalar that's like on their. Their scaler, like that's sort of your only option. I think there's like the assumption that like the uh, that if you're trying to bring in like some images, that those like images are like held in a, some repository. I don't think it necessarily needs to be scaler. We just like put ours in Scalar, and that like hmm, is interesting. How how to like get around like um, the amount of access that you can have, uh, like when you sign up or like when you uh, like define your own like instance by itself, because that's a completely different process. That sort of you have to get more into. Um, hosting sites you would go on to like reclaim or any sort of like hosting um, site and then um, they have like scalar plugins or they they have like scalar you can es establish it and give it a url and like um, like kyle's project and my project is at the uh, ctsdh.org uh, slash Kyle Roberts uh, domain. And These documents that are on Maryland Loyalism, are they post, like, are they, have they been digitally archived by, like, some other place? They, um, so Kyle got a, uh, he received a grant to, like, um, to sort of digitize these rare documents from the Loyal Claims Commission in uh, uh, England. And so he has like JPEG versions and he has um, TIFF versions that were sort of administered to him upon receiving the grant, I, I believe is, is the understanding, or that's my understanding of it. And then we essentially, um, are just like putting it within Scalar and describing it and making an interpretation. Um, and that's. Are those, um, are those facsimiles, those images, are they, have they been put online by the repository that like holds the original documents? I, I'm not sure if there, if there is like a online version of them yet. 
but we do like in our metadata of like say that it is from like the physical copyright from from this is is, is from the loyalist claims commission so i think our project is the first sort of like digitizing of, of these like documents um and they exist they exist in um JPEG and, and TIFF form currently. Okay. Okay. Then you can still upload just like, I mean, just like we're doing media just off your like computer desktop. Mm -hmm. You just can't really do it like, you just do it one by one. <laughs> <laughs> I essentially think I am. Um... I thought digital humanities would solve all of my problems, <laughs> <laughs> like having to not do things one by problems. one. I'm sorry. I, uh, like, no more uh, one by one. <laughs> like, Gail, come on. No, I like I I um I appreciate this discussion because it it does like it's helping me sort of like um, understand sort of relationships between like platforms and hosting and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, like. It's like if you, it's it's like the same sort of issue with, um, you know, you go onto WordPress.com and you can like sign up for an account on their site, but it's all going to be hosted on their server. Yeah. They have the most control of it. Or you can download like the WordPress like package, like on GitHub or whatever, host it on your own server that you pay for space for, and then you have more technical control for different things like it's not going to give you quite as much so so i guess the the answer is like if it's on their own servers one by one but you have more control if you um put the time into hosting it on your own server that you buy and space it's supported for. through like the servers like reclaim yeah reclaim yes. or whatever hosting service yeah it's like reclaim oh yeah there, does... there, there is a plugin too like you can be like i want to make a omeka site and then it will spit out like a whole whole thing like it, it'll make a database entry it'll um give you all the files to the site and then you can go from there it's like relatively easy okay i see yeah. how's everybody doing and their uh and their muddle link I went rogue. Rogue? <laughs> Good. Rogue. Good. That's what I would hope for. I want to I want to talk about like this calling it a book thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't call it a book. I, it gives the option to call it a book. I guess if um, you give it, if you if you just like make pages and like link it together like linearly, like there's a way to like make it a book where it has navigation that just goes on like one level and there's no, it doesn't like contain stuff in it, but like it. Because it mostly like works off of that like hierarchy. I don't ever really see it as as like a book. You could do that if you wanted to, but yeah. It's just interesting that this is trying to kind of replicate the codex in this digital space. And, and what do you think about that coming from not from literary studies? Well, my like thought about calling it a book was. Like, uh, it's really like what we were talking about about like legitimacy as a mm -hmm. like piece of scholarship. Yeah. Um, but also then I started to think about the relationship between book and pages, because mm -hmm. books have pages, and websites have pages as well. Mm -hmm. But the whole relationship between the book and the page is much more like naturalized. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and it also, um, like the relationship between the book and the page, uh, like is experienced differently than like the, you know, sort of 
experience of like navigating through website pages, like you're turning book pages, mm -hmm. right? You have this real sense of like what a page is like from a material standpoint mm -hmm. um, versus like the pages you just like click through on the website. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I was just like, is this an issue of like legitimacy? Is this an issue of like sort of experience? Is this an issue of like trying to represent relationships? Like, mm -hmm. Or to kind of translate it to make it user friendly, you know, if, if they're imagining that the users is familiar with the book and what it does, but it's just a way of. Yeah, I think it sort of problematizes like how we do view these sort of historically defined ways of like what we consider a book or an article, an exhibit and whatnot. It, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't think this is like too like revolutionary in the sense of it's doing like things that are super unfamiliar or like novel, but like it does sort of create some confusion of like, what do we really want to call it? Like uh, Emily earlier was just like, so you're calling it a book a project and you're kind of going back and forth which i've noticed to be the case for sure of like okay what, what is this like and i think it's interesting to to be like oh what is this and it's open up to interpretation but there could be like a situation where you would want to be more explicit of what it is just so there's a better understanding of it i guess it can it can it invites like messiness and um, open-ended like interpretation, but you have to decide if that's if that's like what you would want or if you would want more like structure. Yeah, I mean, I really I like and how how you talked us through this that it is really about like Scaler is really interested in particular pathways, right? And like the connectivity between pages, so that those questions, those considerations that you showed us up front, I think like those are really important. If you're trying to think like, should I choose this or a Mecca or WordPress or build my own, like to think about what are the relationships that you're trying to make? Is there like a distinct pathway that you want your users to move through, mm -hmm. um, or is it do you want something that like allows for kind of a like a less linear like exploration or discoverability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you feel like are the constraints of using Scalar? Like, is there anything you've come across that's just like, gosh, I wish this was different, or like, in a more general sense, mm -hmm. what would you maybe not recommend this platform for? I ran into so many issues making the parallel edition with like how I wanted it to navigate, I guess, like, it's kind of hard to like say it out, out loud of like what I mean by that, but I remember like having to create um, without relying on like the navigational features that are in the admin tools. I had to like define like different URLs, like links on my pages, and then point people in, in that direction. Like I think having a, a sort of um, at least basic understanding of like HTML or like linking between pages like that will sort of like serve you well. So you can sort of hack like if, if, it, if the navigational tools of this platform are like not conducive to what you're what you're wanting, um, you just define it yourself as like a link you define in, in that like content like box like in the edit mode. Uh, I think linking and navigation is probably the biggest issue. Um, for making Dr. Roberts projects, um, this the sort of way that I wanted to organize that as well required like there's that tab feature where you can go to the different sections. That's like a that's a JavaScript like um, UI like thing that I copy and pasted from a resource and getting it to work wasn't too hard, but um, implementing it for the entire site is is kind of where so. Again, like having basic knowledge of like all the, all those languages, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, like the big um, web languages are really going to kind of go far. Which um, there is a lot of resources to uh, to look at, like 
if you do, if you are interested in looking at Scalar, well, we'll go back to these parting questions. I do include like links of like uh, a little bit more about Scalar, um, the Alliance of Networking, Visual Culture, and who they are, but like more generally. And then there's this like um, user guide that kind of goes per like pretty in depth about like how to use it, going over things that I went through today, and then advanced topics like of it goes into some stuff about hosting on your own server. It goes into um, more of the uh, the stuff that you would be interested in, like uh, inserting certain code into like the head of your documents, or you wanted to like do more um, coder hacker man stuff. Uh, is an advanced topics in this user guide, and I found it to be pretty um, helpful. Have you done any visualizations? I did one visualization for our um, for this. The visualizations are not great, but like I think that that really depends on the data that's being represented or like the relationships, um, because I do have like a, a visualization of this like collection. There it goes. And it kind of looks like that, so you can get that sort of sense of it with all the little dots and how it connects that stuff. It's a visualization of the site. Yes. You can do a bunch more of them if you click on the compass up at the top. Mm -hmm. And like you can just see visualizations. That's what I have been playing around with. Connections. And you can like constrain which thing you want to see. I don't know. I played with this for like 20 minutes. It's really fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like parents, like do they need sort of in a database sense or like in a familial sense. <laughs> like in that in that like nesting thing where you're just like um, in the relationships where you're like contain. I want this thing to contain these items. Okay, so in a database. Yeah, database. Not like. Oh no, it's like Benjamin West song. <laughs> oh, only if he's got his own page. But yeah, he doesn't have. Like he's he's gonna exist because I haven't defined any like connections like on the site. But this is like an, a media item that does exist. Like. In the in the uh, the contents, like what do you think the benefit of the visualization is? Like, what does it tell you? Um, I think it's it's just like a creative way of like, because because any sort of visualization where it's just like scatter plotter like like these is just like, what is it really doing? Like, part of me feel feels as though it like serves a aesthetic purpose, but then it also does sort of. Um, bring like a creative interpretation of like what is this data? Is it a site or is it like can we think about it in this way? It's 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 just a, a way of imagining like what the site is. Um, so some like you know network visualizations people will say they allow you to see like they allow you to visualize unseen connections like connections that you would not be able to um, identify. Mm -hmm. um, based on uh, like the way you typically look at like large amounts of data. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me, like as the person that's sort of like involved in the building of the site, if you go through this particular process of building the site in a particular way, and then you look at kind of like visualizations of the site, if you kind of get anything out of that that is um, that allows you then to sort of like rethink like mm -hmm. connections between like you know media items and um, yeah that's so just like that was something that this is inter like it's interesting to me that this is that it's a visualization of the site yeah I, I think that's that's very true and that's that might be like a point of like because do, do you think that like this sort of 
plot does get you like rethinking about the relationship between all of these things or like what sort of thoughts does it yield by like looking at this like what what do you glean? i don't think this one does because i don't think this one is like this because this is just sort of like a sandbox site mm -hmm. but like it would be interesting to look at this like with like like the maryland loyalism project i can try to see if you know i know it's sort of like still in development um but I think it would also depend on who was looking at it and their kind of existing knowledge. Um, no, that's not very good. I didn't know that that compass like allowed you to do visualizations like right there. I think I had to do like a whole other thing. So, like, the way this looks is, like, what are the connections between, like, the one and the other? Like, are there connections between the one? You see what I mean? On the left and on the right? Right. And how could you make connections between what's on the left and, like, these basically these little dyads on the right? Mm -hmm. Like, is that something that's missing from the sort of way the site is designed? Like, should there be more connections? Yes, yeah, so you could ask, like, why are there only sort of like these like little dyad links mm -hmm. and why are there then like this cluster right mm -hmm. and should there be like more like links between those and the cluster mm -hmm. i think um is it still building it yeah it's still building it okay maybe it'll answer at home and you'll be like <laughs> it heard me. It was like asking you shower. Yeah. But there's still some like isolation going on with some of these things. Like not all of these are connected. I think that's that might be actually a good answer to the tagging question of like because there there's this cloud that can be developed and then there's a ta a literal like tagging cloud where like it does that. Maybe in the visualization is like where that becomes like relevant. I just haven't like played with this quite as much, but I mean, so what sort of um, things does this like bring to mind, and how might we rethink this site by looking at this? Like, is it useful in your guys' opinion, or past be looking like pretty and kind of neat? Well, I. I wonder about the accessibility of it, like for somebody that has low vision. Yeah. Absolutely. How would they be able to access this? Absolutely. I feel like this is almost like more of an internal thing. Like this is more to help you as as like the designer mm -hmm. of this website. Like if you've got so many things that aren't necessarily connected, do they need to be connected? Does this mean that the pathways to finding them are more difficult? Mm -hmm. I guess that's my own thing with scalar is that it is very linear. It's a very connection space. And sometimes things definitely do feel like once you've gotten to a point, it's really difficult to get back to something else. Right. Especially yeah. if you kind of break things up. Yeah. Their own like subcategory. Yeah. If you go to the tab called posted up format, I'm going to switch that. No, 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 not the oh, tab. The third tab. The third tab. Oh, force directed format. If you go to tree. Tree radical. What's radical? Radio. You're a radical. This is radio. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I guess it's just this. Hmm. Just this. Interesting. How many are pages? How many are um, media files? Uh, but yeah, radio. That makes sense. What about the tree? I remember the tree being not yeah, like super yeah. great. Yeah. It's just this long line of. Very engineering. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Anna. This notion of like, who is this? You know, who is it? Because I think a lot of visualization, you have to be. However, you interpret something depends on your knowledge already right. and like your experience with it. So your knowledge right. already of like building the site as well as like the content, your sort of thoughts about 
these network visualizations mm -hmm. uh, will be different than uh, someone who doesn't have any idea about like the site or the content. Yeah, I, th I think there's there's definitely definitely in like the the muddling of like um, so there's a muddling of like what do we call it? Is it a book? Is it a project? What is it? There's also a muddling or like a blurring of like what's the difference between like the people who are building the site, the people who are interacting? Because I, I think it like it invites a lot of like collaboration where like people who originally do um, kind of just stumble across the site do become part of its management and um, forward like direction and so they eventually do become like administrators in some sense to where these visualizations might be able to help them so it's it's I guess it's a blurriness between the um, the author and the reader it's it's, it's um, not really intuitive maybe I was gonna say, there's one case I can think of that I've seen that where that type of visualization might help your audience in addition to being an internal decision making tool and that's I forget which online encyclopedia I was looking at but there was one that had like a little you could see like a subset of a connectedness visualization like that for like a particular subject that you have to be reading about and you could see like what are the articles that are connected to this or related like what what's like two or three steps away what are the common links you know where are where are clusters where are not and that was interesting just from sort of a discovery browsing looking at relationships if you were looking in that local section there you could imagine projects here that are similar where if you're just kind of browsing through a collection like that to be able to see what's interrelated, what's more strongly related than not, and sort of the, the two or three steps away just might be interesting to look at. Yeah. And I think that like like um, that might like technically be possible through Scalar, but like in the way that it's like that it asks you to set up its pages and set up the navigation it's not going to be necessarily like um, streamlined like you have to sort of okay. jump in it out of the box <laughs> yeah it would be definitely out of the box but i think that would it, it could be done but i still struggle sometimes with like the the navigation so like when you do get around to sort of like I, th I think like in, in Kyle and I's case with the loyalism project is where it's probably served me the best as like an archiving or like exhibit tool where you can drill down into the um, the, the volumes or the like sections of the like different manuscripts and look at it in like that sort of organized way but as like a book or like a digital edition Maybe not as great, personally. It's interesting because you don't even need to log into your back end dashboard to be able to see these visualizations, even if you just went as a visitor. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like you can see them. So yeah. Wow. That's cool. I wonder why they have that option. <laughs> not worth it? Over time, um, yeah. but thank you so much, Zach, yeah, for yeah, sharing this with us. Yeah, um, there's any Loyola people who want to set up their own instance um, on the CTSTH servers? We can definitely arrange that. And yeah, thanks for sharing and give us some good resources. Yeah, thank you everyone and, um, for coming. Yeah, take some more questions. Pizza. Yeah, take pizza. There will be ending the Facebook Live session. Yeah. Yes. I asked you like a bunch of questions. I went yes. rogue and now I need to go back to yes. understanding Absolutely. what happened. <laughs> yes. That's what I was hoping is, is that like people would log in and we do the same thing.